Hey guys, this is Robert Breedlove from the What Is Money Show. And as you've learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is NIDIG. NIDIG's mission is to facilitate financial security for all. They accomplish this by bringing a high level of professionalization and sophistication to the Bitcoin marketplace. As a true game changer in the industry, NIDIG is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. By using NIDIG, you will gain access to an end-to-end -end institutional-grade platform, providing Bitcoin OTC transactions, Bitcoin collateralized borrowing, secure custody, asset management, derivatives, financing, market research, and more. And all of these services meet the highest regulatory governance and audit standards. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, NIDIG has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and is leading the way for ongoing institutional adoption in this nascent asset class. So please be sure to check out NIDIG as a single source for all your Bitcoin needs. And I love where you got into Claude Shannon's perspective on information and entropy because so what we're doing we know the universe is pervaded by entropy. It's just a, a, a jungle out there, so to speak, full of uncertainty. Yeah. We're basically pushing back the horizons of entropy and creating a little bubble of, of knowledge or information that we call civilization. And within that bubble, that's where we have more freedom because we don't need to think about how am I going to put food on the table tonight or next month or whatever. You know, you can go to work for X hours a day and satisfy that need. And now you've freed up the rest of your time to pursue other aims. And th th that sounds maybe kind of mythological, but Claude Shannon proved, basically proved that. So the information, information theory, theory exactly. is the resolution to entropy. So right. uh, the first measure of information created by Shannon was the bit, which reflected a 50% reduction in the number of possible interpretations for the receiver. So anytime we, we've, transmitted meaning sufficient enough to collapse. Again, we're talking about that pluripotentiality of youth earlier, how it basically collapses by half. That is a bit, right? A bit has reduced our uncertainty by half, effectively. Right, right. And, and now that's how we are measuring. Um, it's a way to quantify information. Yes. Exactly. The way to measure information, like you would uh, use a ruler to measure something else. So, so it's a way to measure information that that quantification of information made yeah. information real. So, and this is all, I mean, it's relatively new. I think he was doing that in the fifties or sixties. So it's still kind of, whereas something like Newtonian physics is very permeated into the, everyone knows, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I don't think as many people know about information theory. Like we're, we're right. in the, <laughs> right. the information age, but it's not widely discussed. But, but again, without that, the way that we use information today in computers and the entire, it wouldn't work. Yes. Right. That's the, that is, that is the, that, that is the point. If I say Amazon, uh, he, 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 even think about how con we perceive information. This is actually what in companies makes communication so hard. We don't hear information the way the sender intends to, uh, to send it. We hear information through our own personal bias and filters. Uh, fair? Right. So if I said Amazon here, we might think Amazon the company. In Brazil, you think Amazon the rainforest. Right. Um, but way more than that, um, and this ties into stoicism and everything else, what somebody says doesn't hurt you. It's your interpretation of what they say that in your own mental model, that what it means to you that hurts you. So, so even the way humans understand that, and that's actually what makes information transmission in humans slow, tedious. You have to reinforce the same thing over and over and over and over again until you build a trust where a trust level where you, you filter out you know, if you if you trust somebody totally they could say something that to some if somebody else said it you would you would blow up if they said it oh no that's my friend right they would they have my back all the time 
So, so, but what's makes that really complicated in humans is we have all our own biases and filters in our, in, in our, in, in, in our world. It doesn't, computers aren't bound by that at all. They see information as it exists and can make judgments on that information. And as you add more information, it gets smarter and smarter and smarter. It's not biased to, uh, to a result that they think it has to look like yeah. through, a, through a filter. And so, so that's what makes it so much over time, so much better. Um, in it, let's use an exa- let's use an example from a, so a, a very real example, and we could explore this on what it would look like in AI in, in time. But let's say the doctor that goes to school for uh, grad, grad school, magic, medical school, school, and everything else, and then discipline in a certain uh, thing. And in that discipline, they've spent a large portion of the younger years going deep into a certain thing. But there's no way they could see all of the information about health that is in your body that's different than my body and different than somebody else. There's, it's impossible. They can yeah. abstract up to a level. They don't. They don't know how your eating patterns affects you, your genetic code versus uh, versus mine, or your sleep patterns, or anything else. Yeah. And they don't know. So they don't have a full picture of their health. They have a picture of a disease or something else that matches something else. And then drug companies, similarly, run these trials with bias that go on for a long time, where they more and more people in this and then when it go, comes out in wide trials there's an unintended consequence of that drug mm-hmm. because there's no way to see all of the information because humans have to bias because we can't see all the information because even if you just think about your genome itself how many pairs how many different combinations it's just a staggering complexity so so that's out so we'd only look at the top piece of the information that we can learn fast enough and the rest is thrown out AI, as it consolidates this information, consolidate the algorithm gets better and better and better. I, I use this example all the time, but my Apple Watch knows more about me than my doctor. It knows my sleep patterns. It knows my it, uh, uh, how much I exercise. It knows it knows my heart rate at all times. It knows a whole bunch of things that my doctor doesn't know. Mm-hmm. As Apple or Google will and everything else, they're going to consolidate other data sets into that data set. And those data sets as they consolidate more data can see things that we can't see that they can predict outcomes way before we could see. And you could just think about some of the predicting a lot of times you're, you go to an eye doctor once a year, once every two years to see eye health, you could do that eye health on everybody through zoom today all the time yeah. and you could see outcomes way fast, and you could consolidate this information in different ways and and you and as you consolidate the information the artificial intelligence does a crazy job better than better than all the errors that the doctors would make because they don't have the information so that's where that's where that's going and and it's going and and so some of the the um, and we got a little bit off topic there, but but it's tied to the fact that 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 information is unstoppable. Right. The inf- and the error correction on it, which computers are doing better than us. First, it'll be us helping the computers, and then it'll be the computers outperforming us. And the benefits to each of us are so profound that we'll use it all day long. It changes, it changes everything. And that change changes a whole bunch of job families. Right. Yeah. And we, sh- and we should want that. Right. Like we should, we should be celebrating that. The only reason we're not celebrating it is we've built a society that requires more jobs. Right. And, it requ- and, and it requires inflation to keep up with rising prices. And we built a, we, we built a society for a different type of world where, where, uh, where, where, where there were, there wasn't as much information. There wasn't as much error correction. There wasn't my, my, this type of technology moving and you could get away with it and have enough jobs to, to, it, it, 
the facts have changed. Yeah, so you, I think it's a lot of great points there. We should be celebrating innovation and entrepreneurship globally. It really should be the highest, for the highest aspiration of people this should be entrepreneurship because it's really what creates the most net benefit for humanity. Right? You need one breakthrough and it's, it benefits everyone everywhere forever. So long as we don't forget that, which, you know, digital age, things are really hard to, to erase innovation specifically, but because of bad beliefs, we've got a bad, when I say bad belief system, I mean, it's flawed, right? We think we need to keep increasing number of jobs and inflation. We are, we're, we're countervailing to that system that could create a lot of goodness. So I say it's bad because it's actually preventing us from creating more goodness. And when you say a, a currency that allows for deflation, I mean, I would interpret that as basically a free market money. The, the market would naturally select the money that holds a, a relatively inflexible supply over time. So that yeah, ex exactly. whatever yeah, sacrifice yeah, yeah. to obtain that money, you know, time and energy, that the supply of that money is reciprocal to that sacrifice. So with Bitcoin, right. it's, it's perfected, right? We have an absolutely scarce supply um, or absolutely fixed supply mapped onto an absolute fixed energy and time that we have to sacrifice for its production. So, and this gets into something I've, I've just read this recently. I'm thinking a lot about it. And I want to get your perspective. So I'm just finishing human action. Second rate yep. of Mises famous work. And he makes the point towards the end. He's, he's uh, really getting on the interventionism thing. He's, he's talking about how bad interventionism is where human beings try to intervene into the, un, we try to hamper the market economy and, and cause it to do things other than it would. And he makes the point that an innovation tends to self-proliferate. So if we come up with a hammer that's really more efficient at driving nails, uh, because it has more utility, it will, it will become accepted in the marketplace. Just like a simple tool will, will proliferate on its own based on its utility. But when it comes to modes of how we organize ourselves, socioeconomic organization, capitalism, socialism, et cetera, that's not necessarily the case, not necessarily the case. Uh, as we touched on earlier, like capitalism is a more efficient social device than communism for mobilizing and marshalling resources and allocating time, capital, et cetera. But we had a long run and still have communism in many pockets of the world today because these ideologies uh, have been, I guess, sold to people. So he makes the point that there is a, there, it's incumbent upon the intellectual leaders in the world to, to corral, uh, what is it, to marshal public opinion towards the model that best benefits them. So, you know, I think this is kind of the 80-20 rule, maybe like 80% of people want to, grab on to ideas that they think are useful. 20% of the people roughly maybe actually question and generate those ideas that the other 80% follow. So it seems to me like historically that maybe we've had people that in that 20% position creating ideas that led the 80% astray, right? To their own benefit. So if I'm living to- You could, ago, so, so let's- yeah, let, uh, so I totally agree. Uh, but in some cases, what I'd say is they didn't actually know they were doing In some cases, deceiving. Right. In some cases, they believed it too. Right. And they so were caught up in their own belief system. Really and, and so th today, there's a whole bunch of people. And I can tell you this because many of the friends, many of my friends are in the World Economic Forum kind of group. Um, and you'd look at that group and you go, are you kidding me? Like, I, I, I couldn't be more against some of the stuff that's coming out of there. But I know some of the people. And, and when you talk to the people um, and, and, and you explain what's happening, the, the light bulb goes on for them too. And it just, their whole mental model breaks down. Yeah. 
and they they they, they start to do the same thing you're doing, the same thing I'm doing, and they and because the belief system doesn't match anymore. So uh, there's a whole bunch of people trapped in a belief system, and when they hear we need to do this, a really good example is what we talked about in one of the other uh, in one of the other shows around uh, around a belief system about climate change that that we have to solve this not knowing that it's the the system itself is the creator of the most of the climate change and it can't be solved from within the system and so so what i would what i would say in that is so i would i would cut some slack and instead of labeling all people because it's easy to just label people and realize there many aren't trying to do that they just are actually fooled by the system as well right no i think they're just completely fooled 100 percent. the the other point mises makes about interventionism is that they almost always think they're doing the right thing right i I want to again the classic i want to increase minimum wage to help the poor Right. Money. I'm going to do that by, by creating inflation. And, and, but it actually, it, this totally it ties into what we're talking about. Um, when you do that, you're removing the free market and you're removing, and, you, and you, there's no way that you can aggregate all the externalities of your decisions. It's impo- so you measure a tiny microcosm and you think you're doing good and you don't measure all of the other externalities. Um, from your mistake and the free market doesn't allow that right right, it doesn't it it it, it's a forcing function and and it and it constantly keeps that in check so uh, so the best information wins right it accounts for all externalities exactly yeah that's a great way to look at it too so it's a it's a global error correcting system exactly and 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 what you and what ends up happening otherwise is is just like the doctor who makes mistakes and doesn't know he makes mistakes because he doesn't have all the information on a, on a complex global system. There's no way a small amount of people could make decisions and understand that the complexity of that, even if they think they can. Right. It's impossible. There's too many, there's too many variables. It's fascinating. So I, this is where I want to take this question. So, Mises confounded me with this because I know many people in the Bitcoin community, myself included, I don't want to use the word inevitable, but I would say Bitcoin is the closest thing to inevitability I've ever seen in the socioeconomic domain. It just is the hardest money by many orders of magnitude we've ever seen, right? It's perfected all the properties of money. If money is continue to compete as they always have been, Uh, as they always have, that Bitcoin would just win. So in in a way, betting on Bitcoin is betting that the free market dynamics, which have shaped money throughout all of of history, will just continue to operate the way they have. And that Bitcoin will continue to operate and therefore it wins. But now I'm questioning this because if Bitcoin wins, we're talking about moving into a new mode of social organization. And... Mises' point is that that requires public opinion buy-in. The public needs to buy into that. So is that what our aim? I love love that you're saying this. It is, if I said there was one thing that I have fear with the Bitcoin community is it seems to the uninitiated, it's polarizing. Right. And it doesn't need to be. And to get to to actually ensure that this happens, we have to make it less polarizing. We, there has to be everybody's caught in a belief system over here, not understanding the externalities and not understanding how this belief system is actually hurting them immensely. And by the way, in that belief system, it is on the way to total state control that path takes you one direction complete state control and it is a very dystopian world in that path and you have uh and you have geopolitical risk 
in in state versus state control of his of citizens. And a lot of people won't even know the difference because they'll believe in that narrative the whole way through. So, so if Bitcoin, if there's a whole bunch of people in Bitcoin who know this is true and can start to say, okay, how could technology look like on the other side? How, why is this such a, a positive for humanity? And how do we paint that picture? Then it's easier to leave the system. And by the way, the existing system has no defense against that. Right. It has no, it has no defense. Yeah. Tell me how, because I just, tell me how the existing system works without manipulation and, and, and control and removing the free market and, 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 and more inequality and removing the free market. If anybody can answer that against the technology, then bring them on a show with you and I, because it's impossible. Right. <laughs> so against technology today. So if that's impossible, then we have a different future ahead of us. And if we paint a better future, you don't, you don't win um, a bully by fighting the bully, right? Or you don't win an idea by talking about all the negative. You win, you win the idea about talking about the positive and what that looks like. Mm. And it is very positive. Right. Yeah. So I, I feel a lot of dissonance about this because I still feel Bitcoin is designed to consume all the monetary premium in the world, like almost algorithmically that pulls people into it over time. Just you have, if you want to, yep. if you're a human and you want to preserve wealth, you're going to end up buying Bitcoin at some point, but the shape of who comes into Bitcoin first, I think can be largely influenced by education. By oh, perfect. Google. Perf perfect. That is such a really, that's a really good way of saying Bitcoin doesn't care about me, you, and it's going to happen. I believe that too. <laughs> um, and, uh, but the shape of who we have coming in and, and how you can have, and how you can bring a whole bunch more people into this that should be into it, that don't know they should be into it. Right. Um, who can build other advocates into it um, matters a lot. Because, because as you reorganize society, because that whole belief system, um, we need a belief system to organize. Yeah. Yeah. And if that, if that belief system is, um, is um, uh, the, uh, just a couple of people with, the, uh, with Bitcoin wealth, which doesn't look like that at all, but some people think it looks like that. Um, you're not going to have a belief system that organizes like that mm -hmm. or is fast or what that looks like. Yeah. We, you know, again, I keep looking at communism as a great canary in the coal mine that there are models that can sound great that are actually catastrophic. So, 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 so today are there, or not to, probably not today, but, but not very long ago, there was a little, there were a whole lot of people um, in the U.S. talking about the China miracle um, and and why a command and control is better. Yeah, and um, and and that China miracle is just by creating debt to GDP the fastest the world has ever seen. It's not a miracle at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, and and having a low labor rate um, against the U.S. where the U.S. funded it all. Um, and now it's to hit a tipping point. And now you can see the, 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 the structure change where the power is all consolidated. And essentially, um, it, China could do anything it wants to its citizens at any time. Mm -hmm. And more and more and more and more and more so, not just to its own citizens, more and more to citizens around the, around the world. It was the more people kind of trust that monetary system. It happened in Hong Kong. Exactly, happening in Hong Kong, and 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 there's tensions rising in uh, in in Taiwan, and there's uh, and so uh, that uh, that system or that belief system, or is happening in the Uyghurs, and uh, and and so that that system. If you want to live in a system like that, and you you decide to give all your control to to a government through through monetary easing or even a short-term benefit of more wealth mm -hmm. because of their because that's happening 
then you're abdicating your freedom. Right. Yeah, it's been powerful. So I, I guess then as, uh, you know, I'll use the term educators, but I think we're just people channeling ideas that we found, you know, I guess after filtering through a lot of critical thought, um, you see the, 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 the ideas that survive the filter. Is what that's, that's it. Some ideas survive the filter. Some don't. Yeah. Um, it's not, yeah, exactly. And that's the bit, I would say the Bitcoin community is just one of the most ruthlessly pragmatic filtration devices for ideas in the world. Like, yeah. Many go in, few come out. Kind of thing. <laughs> it's so true. It's so and, true. And it, so it's incumbent then upon us as educators through platforms like this and through our writing and whatnot, like we actually need to diffuse the FUD. We have to combat the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's being cast at Bitcoin. But the big one that comes to mind is environmentalism. That seems to be the one that's rising now. It's like it's just so easy to have this first order thought that, oh, it consumes energy, therefore it is wasteful, right? It's a very easy narrative to, to make mimetic and sell to people. And um, if you don't understand money, like how it, hard money necessitates energy expenditure to assure a limitation of supply, right? There's no other way to do it. That's what gold was. That's what Bitcoin yeah. is. So that I, I I don't know, I feel strongly about this. So I'd like this to be kind of a call to arms for educators. Like if you're out there, you understand energy, you understand markets, like help us amplify this message because it's a very underdeveloped message, by the way. Nick Carter has oh, a great and, take on it. Yeah, uh, but, yeah. but again, a lot, of the, a lot of the message to, yeah, sorry. A lot of the people on the message today and Nick Carter does a really good job. Uh, uh, Dan Held does a good uh, job. Um, yeah. And I've been threatening to write a piece on this too, but uh, I'm hoping somebody else will based on our messages that we're sharing. What they're talking about, is, what most of people are talking about is um, how Bitcoin gets, uh, Bitcoin advances solar and other because it's a search for the cheapest energy or, or abundant ener uh, energy. And, and that is all true. So it advances solar. What is, a, what is an order of magnitude bigger thing that, that the existing system has no way to answer that we should that we should talk about in fact like instead of, we already talked about this but instead of laser eyes we should be going um and the next meme needs to be i'm in bitcoin for the climate yeah um it, because we have to we have to we have to get that question um so people can so so the message can spread and the question is this so Solar is coming on cheaper, as are other, uh, uh, as are other, and the transition to Bitcoin will be more and more solar, and that energy grid, and actually, utilities will build solar right in and use Bitcoin mining to be able to even out peaks of mm -hmm. solar, right? So, so you can see some of this advancing solar and actually giving an economic advantage to advance solar faster, but all of that is lower cost energy. Mm -hmm. So what has to happen to the existing system is the existing system has to print more money. And here's a really good example. Should oil price be $70, $70 today? No, but oil price has to be $70 because of the printing of the money to drive oil price higher. Mm -hmm. so, so what you're doing by printing money is you're actually driving us off a cliff in a system that has to grow forever and you're manipulating growth, which is impossible. So on the other side of that, solar is going to advance and bring down energy faster and faster. What will happen next? Governments have to print more money to offset all of the technology gains that should be delivering a clean uh, climate. It should be the helping climate. The, the, uh, the existing system is an order of magnitude bigger problem for climate then and, and but people are talking about inside the system about the um instead of the system itself right yeah right so they're talking about the the uh, right right now we're talking about how bitcoin helps you move to 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 solar or we're talking about bitcoin stranded gas everything all, all those things are true but they're the small part of this story 
the big part of the story is as we get cheaper and cheaper energy, which should bring prices down faster and faster, everything in everything, we have to print more money to drive up oil prices to keep using more oil. Yeah. And then Bitcoin is an accelerant to that because as they print more dollars, Bitcoin's reflecting that and its number go up. So more and more people are drawn into it as a store of value, which means they're selling dollars to buy Bitcoin. So you yeah. increase inflationary pressure further on the dollar. Yeah. So yeah, this thing, I mean, it's just going to end It's see all reasons suggest that it's going to end suddenly and catastrophically. Yeah. And, 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 what could happen though, and, and we talked about this a little bit already, but what, what could happen is the inflation rate is being underestimated or, or it might not even be being underestimated because the basket of goods along with technology are deflating. And, and so, so that, that inflation is going into, the, the worst part about it is going into the, the things we need the most as stores of value. Right. Or, and, and some of those, some of those changes will be changed by technology too and change those, those industries, but probably not fast enough to deal with the externalities created by the money printing. And so, so the new, a new system, if you imagine what the new system uh, it, it looks like, it's congruent with human innovation in our time. It's con congruent with, uh, and the existing system is not. And the, and the more that that, and it, it, what's happening is, it was happening slowly at first, Bitcoin 10 years ago. <laughs> and, and there was never before a system that could, you could get out of the system. And so, and then faster and faster and faster along with technology. And it's more visible every day. What we're talking about is more visible to more people and forcing them to ask, uh, ask, ask a question on how this could work, how, how the, ex the existing system cannot function right. both for the climate um, and for without, without consolidating all power. You know, the term that comes to mind here is reflexivity, right? Soros commonly use that for a relationship between price and perceived price, I guess, over time, you know, Bitcoin exhibits a lot of reflexivity in that the more its market cap expands against in a fixed supply, the more it could be expected to expand over time. Right. So, but there's a reflexivity here between man and tool or, you know, creator and created. And it seems like, I guess the theme here is that digital technology and artificial intelligence more specifically, is just a better tool set for dealing with complexity. So we're it, it, that's it. So probably the simplest thing is our biological brain in the energy in it and to time to develop the super highways of neurons connecting, take practice, 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 practice. And once those are connected, it's not that we can't learn new things, but new things are harder because we have to remap our brain into the new, new connections, new super highways of information. So learn any new sport, learn any new anything, learn a new language. It, the first part is really hard. Right. Because you have nothing to map to. And, and versus, versus an expert in the field is uh, they can see the patterns faster. That's your biological computer and it has strengths and weaknesses. And, but the same function, the same idea is built into machine learning or in, in artificial intelligence. And, and it, it, can't, it, it doesn't have to make choices of just this narrow piece of data in time with compute. It can see all the data signals and it can see things that are outside of your view that you don't know affect your, your data model, your, your own internal algorithm, but it can see. And that's what and that's what changes the rules. So have you have you seen GPT three? No, I haven't. Yeah. So 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 take a uh, take take a look at that and um, and 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 where that was just a year ago versus where it is now. It can write. It can write books. It can write songs. It can it, you if you give it a couple of uh, inputs and you can go onto GitHub and give it a couple of inputs. Give me a table and a cucumber and it will design furniture 
that would blow your mind that would give you and you when you look at some of this furniture you go holy cow um or or that you'd never come up with that as a human being but now you think about the what that what that does it can see patterns yeah that we can't see now, is that the thing where i did interact with an ai on a web browser where you put in a word or a couple of words and it you know tell me about it and it just responds with a yeah like, and I put in bitcoin or something it responded like bitcoin is is telling me the whole story about bitcoin it's pretty interesting so so that is if you if you thought where that evolution is in the first iteration it was mostly errors the second iteration was just created by way more data mm -hmm. unstructured data yeah not, not not structured data which and and just a staggering amount more data which is now not perfect yet not but yeah but but competing against human intelligence in in this intelligence but as an output showing you things that you would never you'd never understand were actually not designed by humans the next iteration will it will blow people's minds so so we won't we might not know if if a tweet was written by a human or not or a book was written by a human or not we like we might not have, have any clue we might be inter interacting with avatars that we have no clue that's where it's going that's incredible to think about because then if it gets to that point it seems like then you could almost upload your i don't know if it's uploading your consciousness necessarily but you could upload maybe your mental models to this thing and it could just synthesize everyone's mental models and be some super intelligence of some kind at, at some at some point that's where we're going yeah right at some point have you have you looked at the simulation hypothesis uh a little bit this is ray kurtzwell i think uh not ray uh, uh i'm gonna forget the uh, he wrote uh, Nick Boystrom, Super Intelligence. He wrote, uh, about oh, he wrote Super Intelligence. Okay, yeah. The gist of it is we're living in a video game of some kind. Right? Video game, yeah. And and so so the 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 sense of um, we know today what's happening with virtual reality and and in games that that it's hard to distinguish today once you're in one of these virtual reality settings between real and virtual. And we know computer power is is getting better and better and, and that simulation is getting better and better all the time what's the chance what are the chances that uh, this is the first time it's happened and and it kind of blows your brain but uh um but um but but when you look at um it, uh, when you look at time and space and everything else, and you 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 think about what what the universe, it's a plausible theory, right? I think it was the ancient. I want to say ancient Hindus. I could be wrong about this. Like as, as much as ten thousand years ago, um, we're say the uh, I don't remember where it comes from, but the the quote is that all is mind. That they actually thought everything i think they called it the maya maybe the grand cosmic illusion that there's we think consciousness today scientifically is generated between the years and it's biological but they actually thought it was something much more fundamental that the yeah. universe is conscious and we are the universe like experiencing itself but i don't know i think it's very very meta and out there um but i so the point you made earlier though that we we bootstrap our own intelligence by basically colliding with the real world that gives us the data that enriches us to, that's what intelligence is actually it, it, assimilating that feedback into the future mental models or perceptions of the world in a way that it's improving itself. And so with AI, we're, it sounds like we're kind of in that early stage where it's just now we're, we're building out the data sets to where there's so large that we can feed this AI to train itself to clear errors, to become more adept at whatever its narrow focus is. Um, and it, yeah, once it, I guess once it gets past that 
that kind of bootstrapping phase, it could almost take over itself, right? It could start programming. Well, the, yeah. So, so think about what, so what drives it is the data collection. And so if you're trying to create a platform around collecting data, that's probably the most fundamental thing you need to understand. How do you get people to give you data or how do you consume data in a way that makes the AI model work and gets better? So it's a network effect of data that is creating, uh, creating AI. And, uh, and it, what you can hire the best, uh, best uh, AI researchers and, and, and the like when you have vast sums of data because you can make experiments faster and you can train algorithms faster and it gets better and better and better. So you're just kind of against, uh, um, that's how the ranking on, on Google works with no people. It's trying to reduce errors and find the search result you, you do, you want you directly to you against almost infinite supply trying to find you. Same as Amazon. Um, and it's doing that. And then what comes out of that after, uh, after doing that, you can, then you can start to add voice text to voice and then voice and everything else. And if you look at, if you look at Alexa today, the types of skills and the types of skills that it's collecting more data to learn all the time, get smarter and smarter and smarter and add, adds more capabilities and more scale, skills. That's the, that's the way that model model works, but it's all around us. And, and some of the, and, and in businesses, if people wanted to take advantage of some of this, it's almost free to use through, through, uh, through AWS um, uh, or, uh, uh, or Google um, or, uh, or Microsoft. Um, and it's almost three, free to use because they're trying to advance their, their AI. Right, they're, they're trying to collect your information data. to be able to to, yeah. to to do that. So that's the race right now is to just that's the that's that's the race, yeah. and the race is a the race is also at a geopolitical level, right? Um, and uh, and and China has an advantage in that race because uh, because it can and it, at least right now on a currency foundation that today we live in because because it can control its citizens and it can, it can collect the data without, without changing laws to be able to collect the data. Yeah. It's, what, so, it, I mean, some people are, this can be fear inducing in a way. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of promise like most innovations, but this one is different to the point you, making the book is this is not even electricity you know this is electricity that thinks kind of thing so right. you, do, how do you feel about that what are your do you have general concerns about general ai yeah, so so it'd be possible to say no i don't especially so i would tend to think if if humanity creates this in a way that's distributed or more distributed on a on a system like bitcoin we will have better outcomes. If it doesn't, if it gets consolidated by a superpower or a couple superpowers, the outcomes will be very different. Right. So whether it's politicized or not, if it's apolitical, it, 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 it will be able to. If you just said, if you if you said I could control it and I and and give me an give me the output that convinces the most people, right? You could you could target every single person with a different message. To be able to to do that at scale, wow. right? Like Facebook, like Facebook does, but on a superpower on Facebook, right? What is your what uh, what Robert? What's your hope and dream? What do, how do I tie into that to make this compelling message for you, yeah. at, uh, at, at 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 something that you have no idea is happening? So there's a major race to open source this thing as well, right? If there is some inflection point breakthrough yeah and i think that's one of the things that kind of in an open source model it's it's hard um it's it's harder because because we want to use the best algorithm mm -hmm. right because the best algorithm gives us so much more benefit nobody uses nobody uses bing they use google mm -hmm. right and it and it aggregates more and more in that so that's something that that just have to it has to be thought through 
but again, and, um, but a system like Bitcoin removes power from the consolidation of that faster. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Because right now you're funneling money into making that happen faster, both at a, both at a company level and at a geopolitical level. You're printing money to make it happen faster. And, and those companies are removing labor to do, they're not trying to do bad. They're trying to give more service for less. It's just the AI can do it better than us. Right. So is it, you know, Mises talks a lot about the, the main function of economics is that people are seeking to satisfy more wants more quickly or to higher degrees, right? That's what we're all trying to do. We're, we're trading and competing and trying to figure things out so we can satisfy more human wants. Yeah. Is that, that's the same thing as error correction, I guess, because we're correcting errors in the pursuit of particular aims. But I got this outcome. That's an error. I need to correct that. Am I thinking so about I th- that? So I think they're slightly different in this way. Um, and, um, one of the things that we talked about it on one of the other shows that when I, when I look at myself and all the errors I make, not just in the things in what are the things that are holding me back from seeing something different? And a lot of those you talked about as you get older, you, removing your ego and everything else. So you could be more curious. A lot of those things were self-imposed because of a, of a need to belong. And so you do more and more that you would, you would push against not realizing that you were stopping yourself or that I was stopping myself. Mm-hmm. And my biggest breakthroughs personally came from those breakthroughs because once I saw that these, these things exist in everybody, these biases and how we show up and how we want to show up and how we want to be perceived to other people, they're not just, if I look around in there and everyone I see, they're also in me. Mm-hmm. And so how can I be more aware of those things? And how can I, how can I adjust those errors as well? And what I've noticed is those are the biggest errors. Mm-hmm. And then those errors. And so, so that's different than, than what Mises was saying. Right. And, but let me use an example of one of those errors. How much money do I need? Mm-hmm. How much do I really need? Like, I need enough to enjoy time with my family. I need time to go on vacation. I need time to do the things I want to do. But how much is that? Is it 20 million, 100 million, 10 million, 1 million? Because I know this, I've had zero and been really happy. Like, unbelievable happy with friends, family that, that just, and, and, and zero and not that long ago in when I left a business, uh, a negative, negative wealth, I've had hundreds of millions and, and that amount of money, which is just a belief system that I need for some other reason, for some other validation is arbitrary, completely arbitrary. And the number of uh, the number of friends that I know that have sold their businesses for fifty million, hundred million, two hundred million, and then been totally lost because they've lost their calling, mm-hmm. is staggering. And and so when you see this around people, a whole bunch of other people, you realize maybe that's in me too. And why do I? Wh- how much do I need? So so that is where that differentiates because we get caught in a trap of telling us our own lies about why we want the things we want when, when we don't really want them for that reason, we want them for the reason that we think it gives us, it gives us more social standing or it gives us more belonging or it gives us an ability to do something. Money itself is completely arbitrary. I could be super happy that, and this is, (laughs) I could be super happy living in the forest, with friends and family and everything else and just being able to uh, completely off grid. In fact, I have a, 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 a cabin on 50 square miles um, with a bunch of friends that we built just that, for that, just as a super fun getaway, uh, super fun getaway. 
um, and it's on a, a lake and and i could go live there and just be super happy yeah um, I, like so so what do you really need and why do you need it and that's that that's that point we delude ourselves on a lot of these things but the story becomes very real to us that's interesting so there's yeah the, the, there is an error correction layer on the wants themselves where we, on the wants themselves yeah. exactly on the thing and it, and it, there doesn't have to be maybe you never correct that error mm -hmm. and you go through your life as a lie um i have seen people at their end of their life wish they could do a do-over because they've chased so hard and they have outwardly what everybody thinks would be a perfect life and inwardly they're dying wow. because they, they, they and you want profound sadness for, uh, see that and wow. so and and what, what that says is somebody who never corrected that error never understood why they were doing it in the first place that's cool wow so yeah it's there's a yeah, an intelligence layer exists uh I don't know if you say above or below, but just superordinate to the want satisfaction layer. Right. The wants do change with age and time experience. They, they change. Yeah. They, the wants change with age, time experience and they, learning they, they where change. they don't have to, they don't have to change. Right. They don't they, have to change. They tend to change. But you see people in your life that are telling you a story about what they need and the reasons why they need it. And you know, fully well, Mm -hmm. that story is a lie that and they might be the only ones that believe it but for them it's very true the capacity for self-deception is is truly scary because you you know you need to trust yourself but sometimes you you gotta check yourself as well so that's where that's that's where some of the biggest and 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 I, and, and and i know you share this is it's impossible to so in economics and everything else because we think about ourselves all the time Right. We, we do like most of the time yeah. we l l look at photos with all your friends, you key on how you, what you look. Right. 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 <laughs> like you just, and so we think it's everybody else who does that, but it's us too. Right. Yeah. And, and we think about ourselves constantly. How do we show up here? What did I say here? What did I, and, and we're so deluded in that. And, the, um, and, and that, and that's why it's hard to break economics away from the self too, or our or, or error, error correction away from the self too, because we're full of errors and biases and everything else and belief system that we don't know we're full of. Right. So, yeah, it's a great point that we, I mean, all of the sensorial input we have it just keeps reinforcing that belief, right? It's like, there's just a me inside of this uh, layer of perceptions, but I guess through a, a number of things, we said time and experience. I would even argue that actually studying Bitcoin, or you know, people talk about it lowering your time preference. So it's, it's broadening your time horizons, but it's also taking you outside of yourself because you start right. to look at things in a broader historical scope and you realize how small of a part of that you really are. Totally. <laughs> totally. It's small, it's small. Like by the day almost, I'm like, it's incredible. Um, so that's all really interesting. So uh, intellect is just so complex. Um, but if I'll try and one bridge, I thought back to energy a little bit, because these two okay. domains, information and energy, as we talked originally, it's like if you can come to see the world through those lenses, you, you can see it more clearly, basically. So we can say that improving so through social cooperation, the division of labor, capitalism, we're increasing the energy efficiency uh, of our efforts, of our economic efforts. So we can create more units of output per input. Uh, less waste. Yeah. Less waste. Um, harmoniously acting together. So working in concert, uh, coordinated by a pri you know an undisturbed price signal, preferably would be best. And that this is tied to thinking um and th this is a this is a quote from albert alfred north whitehead which i think is just tremendous so i'll read the quote he says quote it is a profoundly erroneous truism 
repeated by all copy books and by eminent people when they're making speeches, that we should cultivate the habit of thinking about what we're doing. The precise opposite is the case. Civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. I, I love that. So intelligence, error correction, you know, or maybe error minimization in a way, because if we can just prevent errors in the model, it, it's tied directly to energy efficiency, which is the entire presupposed purpose of civilization. <laughs> so, so I'm going to make a real example uh, for you in this. The amount of people that te teach entrepreneurship, that what is entrepreneurship? It's jumping off the deep end with an idea that you're going to change something and, and not knowing any idea how you're going to do it, but you go all in. Yeah. And, and when you said action, the thing that rang in my head is if, if I think about the person, the greatest gift of me starting a company was the learning on the way through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know the learning was coming. It was, a, it was, it was from the action to try to solve a problem that I realized I was completely incapable of solving without a whole bunch of learning. I was so in the deep end. And, and, and a lot of people talk about entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs um, are always living on that knife edge. Mm -hmm. They know the, the feeling of being going, Elon Musk a year ago was a month away from being out of business. A month away. He tried to sell to Apple. Apple said no. A month away. And look at today. But what ends up happening is we rewrite history to the winners and, and, and neglect everything that happened on the way to, uh, to get there. And that win is a knife edge all the time. This is the and, iceberg and so, penalty, right? Just see exactly. It, and, see it and you only, you only see the top. It doesn't, and it doesn't look like that. And so what you just said and that action is so true because the action, the action you can error correct on really fast. Yeah. Yeah. And this is pointing to labor elimination too, right? The more we can take effort out of an important operation, the more free we are to pursue other aims. And that's what that's that's the puzzle piece that I cannot I cannot I realize the system we're in. I realize the system we're going to. I cannot believe we have politicians, whether knowingly or unknowingly, it wouldn't wouldn't say wouldn't put these things together, especially with some of the stuff that I've written. Other people are now starting to gain. I would I can't believe we're not uh, having people talk about the truth and what they're going to do right. to make sure that that you can get more with less out, uh, with without with less output. We're going to embrace technology. We're going to embrace stable money, and and as a byproduct of that, we're going to give you more with less output. But, I cannot believe I cannot believe that's not, not not happening. Now it's such a change in belief systems what people know. Yeah. But but again, if you want to stand out from the crowd, you go to where no one is. Right. You go to you go where the truth is, and that's how you, and, and and that's how and that's how you build. Um, that's that's how you build a following. That's a beautiful way to put it. Go where that's what entrepreneur. That's what on. Un, that's what entrepreneurs do. They see a truth that they they see something that doesn't make sense, yeah. and it bugs them so much that they jump and, and and a lot of times, they don't do it because they want to be an entrepreneur. They do it because they desperately want to solve a problem. And that yeah, so they're correcting an error to more closely approach the truth. Exa exactly. Yeah, that's a beautiful way to put it. So yeah, we keep hammering on error correction, but it's also. Entrepreneur, entrepreneurship is pulling us closer to truth. So, yeah. it's a, and now, so every time you hear a, 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 a politician say, "We're going to get more jobs," and the only way to get jobs is reduce your labor rate through inflation, put that, put that, try to square that puzzle, because that's what that's what's happening. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, so, and and it it and again more and more people are questioning that every day yeah. and it's going to be impossible. To, it's, I, I think it's going to be impossible to keep that fallacy right. 
uh, that humanity believes today, or a lot of humanity believes today, in a in a box. Right. I think Bitcoin is that forcing function that has brought light uh, brought light to that fallacy. It's a great, and there's a quote from your book: "When new thinking is needed, it is very easy for us to remain entrenched." I mean, this is again back to that biological default mode network. We just have these grooves, these patterns of act, patterns of action that we've carried out for years, and we're, we're almost stuck within them. And very, very rarely do we take the step back to observe the whole. And I get the sense I get with the politicians and I would also put central banking bureaucrats, sovereign wealth fund managers yeah. in bucket. The limited interaction I've had with that group is they're just out of touch with reality. They don't perceive Bitcoin as re- even a real thing, like or a real thing. Is, in, in a lot of cases, and that's changing. You can see that changing. Um, and you can see it changing really fast because, the uh, again, when facts change, smart people change. Yeah. Um, but imagine, so in any business, uh, there's a really great uh, 60 Minutes uh, uh, thing on Amazon in 99, um, and, and the interviewer chuckling that it could be, it, it could uh, be worth more than Sears. So uh, somebody who wrote code could be like uh, chuckling. And it was, it's so if you go look it up, it's just, it, it makes you laugh, yeah. right? Because, because, but you can understand Sears and all the entrenchment and everything else. And what ends up happening is over time, as you become, you, you see a whole bunch of things that come and go, and most of them are noise. And it locks in your, your perception. And, and so, so new things come and you don't even look at them anymore. You don't look at them with the same curiosity when you're, when you're, when you're, when, when you're trying to build something new and to tax it, you don't look at them with the same curiosity that this could change, change everything else. Cause you've seen the movie over and over and over again. And most time, the mono- most times in the history, the monopoly wins. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but, but, in a times of great change, like we have today, the beginner's mind has the advantage because it's curious. Mm-hmm. It wants to learn. It's not, not curious to try to defend a previous status quo, curious for the facts, error correction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and with new facts, new, new businesses, new opportunities emerge. But it's pretty normal that if you said a bunch of economists, how many times that people, that when they're kind of looking at their models, which are they can't not cal- calculate all the externalities, and they're looking backwards against different time periods in a world that's changing, they think they're operating a playbook that they can control. Hmm. Um, and they've seen a bunch of these movies before, and they'll st- say all the reasons. Those reasons don't make sense anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's actually why... <laughs> The truth will win, right? Because because there's it's just this house of cards over here that there it like as people poke on it, <laughs> right? There there's just hand waving. Yeah, I, the the visual I have is we're, we're trying to build these structures to get more energy efficiency, right? To get more outputs per unit of input, and the structures. There, there's the error is inherent to that product process. We're constantly trying new things. You know, 95% of them don't work. 5% do, and they sort of stick and build. But occasionally, it seems like if that that structure goes the wrong direction for too long, we almost have to go regress a little bit and break down, take a few steps back to go forward. Right. Um, well, that's what capitalism is supposed to do. Right. Right. And so capitalism it's not capitalism people we don't operate in a capitalism world today in the in the us either not even close it's just crony capitalism because fiat lets us take more wrong steps in the wrong direction will that ever correct so nothing grows forever yeah you um spring becomes summer summer becomes autumn autumn becomes winter seasons nature changes it ebbs and flows yes if you if you if you stop uh in the same tail i put it this grid if you if if you stop small forest fires, then you get way larger forest fires because there's more brush. 
mm-hmm. be able to, uh, to, uh, to burn. If you stop small, small events from, uh, from recessions yeah. and you keep on pretending you can grow forever, you, uh, a depression ensues. Yes. Yeah. You create a, create a massive unwind. So by stopping the free market from working, creative destruction moved from the company level uh, to the economy level yeah. to the currency level. Wow. And so now you have creative destruction at a currency level. Yeah. And Bitcoin is that creative destruction, the new entrant that, w- that I believe will take down all currencies. Mm. And, and, then, and, it, and it's and it's exactly what you just said. Um, it's because of trying to to manipulate a market right over over the actual market over the free price signal right. And over time, you have to manipulate it more and more and more externalities that you don't see. Right, because a government can go out, misallocate capital, make bad decisions, but there's no accountability that pulls them back to reality, right? Because they can just paper over that bad decision-making with more bad decision-making. They're confiscating more economic surplus of the economy. And they can, so they can continue to go off course for some time. So I'd say, yeah. And, and, but yeah, just um, the government right now, or the, is in the Fed is saying, we are trying everything we can. So we're gonna target inflation. We're gonna to try to increase inflation. Mm-hmm. So what is that saying? We're going to have a zero bound interest rate and we're going to manipulate interest rates lower. Mm-hmm. We're going to do yield curve control to manipulate interest rates lower. We're going to keep printing money. Stated policy goal. Yep. Um, what does that tell every CEO that's uh, in, a, in a normal market on capitalism? What, what you would do is you would save cash for a rainy day. Mm-hmm. And then when, when one of your competitors um, was too fragile in a, in a recession, you would take them over and consolidate their win because they, they, they spent too much to try to grow too much Mm -hmm. and they were weak going into a bad time. In this environment, every CEO is incented because, because, because you would never have cash on your balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Um, so you'd buy back your stocks. Mm -hmm because it's the best thing you can you do you do for your shareholders. So so you and if you don't buy back your stocks, if you don't do that and you keep cash on your balance sheet, you won't be the CEO for long. Right. That's how the free market works, <laughs> right? So because your returns will be terrible. Yeah. Um they they won't match the market and you'll get puni- your stock will get punished. So so in that environment each person is making the uh, a really good decision in an environment that makes them make bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And then when there's a, then when there's a problem in the market, because it it was created by B because of the structure of the market, Mm -hmm. because it's not a real market, then, then all of those companies would fail without life support from the government. Mm -hmm. And, and, and those CEOs can go and say, all these jobs are gone unless you bail me out. Right. The government has to bail them out and you get consequences of the actions that get reinforced, that get bigger and bigger and bigger every time, all because of breaking the rules of, of a free market. Until the crack up boom and the government can't bail out these companies, right? You're exactly. Just- that's, what the, that's why, that's what, yeah. Forest fire. Yeah. So that's why I said um, creative destruction is moving to the currency level yeah. because you can see that crack up boom coming. Yeah. Yeah. Another way I was thinking about this the other day is that um, in terms of space and time is that debt gives us the ability to grow more quickly across space. You could say where you could actually, you know, borrow money, buy back your shares. You can increase EPS immediately in the present where, uh, but it, but it comes at the expense of fragility across time. Because now all of a sudden you're levered in the event that there's you know s- significant economic variability or downturn in the market, you're, you can blow up, right? And then you're you're more well capitalized uh, competitor, say that has less debt on their balance sheet, although they didn't get this benefit of immediate growth across time by by using leverage or debt capital, 
they had more sustainability, I'm sorry, across space, they had more uh, longevity across time. So there's this trade-off. So, so, so now in a normal market, that's exactly right. Yeah. But in this market. Everybody's pushed into the immediacy. Everybody's pushed in the immediate. And if you, if you actually saved cash for that trade-off, you're getting wiped out. You won't be in business. Exactly. So it's right. so 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 you're creating more fragility in the system at every step, and and that's why like there we don't have anything close to capitalism right now, right? Because it, be, it, it just and for people who think we're going to have runaway inflation, um, yeah. the um, at some point governments could create it by by totally debasing their currencies, but just remember if if stimulus is ever removed, ever removed. Everything sets. It's all over. The stimulus has to keep increasing. Yeah. And then if it so, because you're not creating, you're not creating, you're not creating um, uh, more com- uh, really great value here. You're creating a whole bunch of zombified companies. Companies. Yeah. So maybe another. Uh, I'm on a limb here, but we're we're forcing risk premium into the currency. Through inflation, right? There's a there's a risk, uh, a cost of risk injected into the currency, which then forces anyone operating on the currency to take on more risk. Right? If you're not if if yeah. you is increasing at 15% a year, if you're not expanding your cash flows above 15% a year, you're not creating any value. You're going to get canned or go out of business, right? So you have to take right. on more and more risk, more acquisitions, more new markets, more right. leverage more whatever exotic bet and at the end of that risk spectrum today is bitcoin so it's like this yeah. system that is imploding on itself is also forcing market entrance into bitcoin over time okay i'm gonna, say, I'm gonna tie something to exactly what you're saying but it's a long way around <laughs> um most uh, um most people believe the uh, be, believe an entrepreneur is a risk taker mm-hmm nothing could be further from the truth and and i and they're 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 probably the best asymmetric bet taker mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what what they're doing is they're betting because there's risk everywhere there's risk i go get a job in a different company and my i just don't see my risk because i think it doesn't exist because i have a job mm-hmm. whereas the entrepreneur says I'm capable of this. And even if I'm not, I'm going to learn so much that even at a zero, I learn more than that spot. Mm. And, and the, and so the asymmetric bet on that is a crazy asymmetric bet that it could be a huge win. And even in a loss, I win, I win more than the other path. Mm. That's so, so, so there's a fallacy that entrepreneurs are risk takers. It's not true. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an asymmetric bet and it is a bet on yourself. It's a bet on, on your belief and to be able to come out over odds. And for that, the benefit of that is you learn at a rate that is hardly hard to match because you put through the knot hole back to that action. Yeah. So, so now I'm going to connect that to the other thing in the same thing. And it's why Michael Saylor sees Bitcoin. It's why I see Bitcoin. It's why a whole bunch of, it's the best asymmetric bet I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, I've ever seen. I, 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 I've made a lot on different technology companies. It might be the best asymmetric. And, and the risk isn't in Bitcoin. And let's, let's just, so, so people realize, um, I want to be curious always. I don't want to get so locked into Bitcoin that I'm not curious about a potential risk. So I do want to stay humble and everything else. And I, and I'm constantly looking at potential risks, bringing them in and saying everything else. But when I examine all of that and I think about the risk in Bitcoin versus the risk in the existing system, it is not a risk. It's an asymmetric bet. Right. And so, so, and I can't believe, but, but, but by the way, that's actually how you, how you do very well. Um, you see things before other people see them. You see, you see market functions that nobody else understands and they, they perceive risk differently. Mm -hmm. And if we're wrong, 
will be wrong um, spectacularly. Um, I don't think we're wrong. I think it's a crazy asymmetric bet and the existing system is going to implode at some point. Um, and, and, um, and, and, and therefore as a byproduct of that, most of the risk and most of the people's wealth is in the existing system on a system that they're guaranteed to lose money on. And, and if that system keeps working, kind of negative yield bonds and everything else, and if that keep, system keeps working and they're accumulating assets like real estate and everything else on top of it, that system, then the tail risk of that system is revolution mm -hmm. where those assets will be, even, even if it doesn't go through depression, um, the tail risk on that is revolution where, where the same outcome. That's, so, uh, so the existing system has all the risk. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, um, when people don't understand that or when people, I, I, like, I just, I do, I do my best. You do on this, but, but Bitcoin at the very least is a, is a lifeboat away from that. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a, a lifeboat for the wealthy. It should be, it should be for everybody to be able to think about uh, doing that the, the beautiful thing about it is um uh, it doesn't care it's a lifeboat for everybody yeah universal accessibility of it is key uh universal transparency of all the rules are key it's often what i describe bitcoin is that it's just the best game you could hope for right where it has clear and transparent rules they're equitable they are optimized for the users of money. Effectively, it is a money. Yeah, it can be changed, right? So there's no there's no corrupting it. There's no politicking it, which that is the the source of pretty much all the, the problems, the errors. Let's say in our our existing socioeconomic structures, it's the human element. The 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 rules are bent and twisted and broken. It's funny how it always comes back to that. It's, it's the it's the observer in the system, and the observer in the system is us, and yeah. uh, and our biases and everything else that create that. Yeah. And try to and try to overcome a free market. Right. With our because we're so smart, we're smarter than those other people. We can help them more than they can help. Them. That is what creates kind of this path to ever more manipulation. Yeah, and then. In that context, Bitcoin is just a bias-proof database. Ultimately, right? it's like, did you do the work? Did you sign the transaction? It just there's no political attack vector on the the base layer of what it represents as money, and that is yeah. hard to understate how big of a deal that is. I'm sorry, hard to overstate how big of a deal that is. And to your point, it's it is the ultimate asymmetric bet because it's a it's a, a base. You can think of money as like the base layer operating system. So if Bitcoin succeeds, it's a call option on everything. Right. Call option that's on what it, all the that's capital what I, that, that will be produced, yeah. all the productivity that currently exists, all the capital that will ever be produced, which by the way, we think would explode under a Bitcoin standard. You know, the world would be much more wealthy. Um, so I wonder it, if it wouldn't, it wouldn't. So, so here, here's the thing. And I think we do just need to pull on that mm -hmm. thread. When, when people are measuring their wealth today, it's in a point of time with assets going up and debt going up and liabilities going up on that debt and, and, and the money being worth less and less. And so, uh, so, so it's really hard to understand what a new system could look like. And so people say, and, and people could, then you have Bitcoin could go to 10 million, 20 million, 1 million and everything else. And what they're talking about is Bitcoin in fiat terms. Yes. And Bitcoin, and, and you know this, but Bitcoin in Turkish Lira is a different number than it is in Canada and US and everything else. And all those are subject to massive changes. Mm -hmm. So so if you wanted to know what Bitcoin would be worth in today's relative value, you would look at the assets of the world minus the liabilities of the world divided by 21 million as a point of time today. Yes. Would um, If what we're saying continues to happen in Bitcoin and it, and essentially it becomes a monetary standard for the world. That's what happens. Yeah. And that's a big number, but it's a relative number to, to, to our experience of the world today. Mm. 
Bitcoin could come down in value, but its relative purchasing could go way up. And so, 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 so it, it's, uh, it, and that's probably the more important concept. And I know you know this, uh, this already, Robert, but when you measure in, so a house value last year in Bitcoin terms, an average house in the US would have cost 15 Bitcoin mm-hmm. um, or 20 Bitcoin. Today, that same house costs five Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so when you measure in Bitcoin, what will happen is you see the deflation and the natural deflation of the world. Mm-hmm. And the byproduct of that uh, is abundance gained and lower and lower pri- prices and more time. Yeah. 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 Everything's getting cheaper. I guess my the point I'm trying to make there is that theoretically, that's all we really have at this point because we don't know what the Bitcoin standard looks like empirically that with less barriers to free trade, total output of goods and services would be much higher than it is today. Now, I'm not, you know, it would be different. We wouldn't be producing as much fiat crap out of China necessarily, but our productivity would be higher essentially. And therefore yeah. capital creation would be greater. I know it would be different, but. This is actually the, the the part that, so a lot of people believe we'd grow faster because you, and let's just say, forget Bitcoin. We had remove all the debt mm-hmm. and, and, and start new on a new system. We would grow faster because we don't have an overhang. We don't have to pay back the past. Right. So that, and I think that's what you're saying, but, but when you now tie that to what's happening in technology, that growth itself is more deflationary we're getting information for free and that information is also going to be our things. Mm -hmm. It's not growth in the same way that we think about growth today. Agreed. So so we've bounced on this growth point a number of times. I guess in my mind, what I'm saying is more goods and services, more wants satisfied. We'll just leave it at that per hour of there you go. There, there, there's a beautiful way to, way, way to do it. You, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. And so Bitcoin, the Bitcoin's a call option on the whole thing, right? All the capital that's ever been produced, all the productivity and service and time and knowledge that's currently available. And then all of the want satisfaction that will ever be produced for the rest of time in theory, like we don't fear, we clearly, we don't know if, something else could disrupt Bitcoin in 500 years, whatever, we have no idea, but for a long, for the conceivable future, so long as we have money, uh, it seems that Bitcoin would be the dominant technology in the world. So I wanted to, I want to pose this question, this perspective. We're talking about intelligence is error correction. A government on a gold standard, let's just assume they couldn't, run a fractional reserve or run fiat on top of gold, like they were on a full reserve gold standard. That government is now penalized like any other free market enterprise for bad decision making. So if it makes errors and it allocates capital a certain way and the market does not reward that allocation, they would suffer losses and that part of the government would then shrink. So could we say, and maybe this is a stretch, but that gold itself was an analog AI of some sort. It was this distributed money, free market selected money that kept governments in check. Like so long as they had to satisfy convertibility of dollars to gold and they had to maintain a a one-to-one reserve, that it it was a, a forcing function on government in a way that, that forced them to be accountable to their it, was a for, it wasn't it wasn't anything like AI, but it was a forcing function on uh, on control. Or it was a forcing function on accountability. Yeah, and that uh, um, for sure. So I use that term loosely. I say analog AI because I know it's not thinking clearly, but it's yeah. sort of gold was embodying the collective decision of market participants across time, and it could keep government in check. Yeah. So. So, so let's just pull on that analog a little bit uh, the, um, uh, because so if you kind of go through history and you say 
uh, uh, Britain gold reserves and the pound and how long that lasted. And, and a lot of that was driven by essentially colonizing the world and taking, uh, yeah. taking wealth from other nations and bringing it back. And, it, and this, and their, and the, and their monetary standard wouldn't have lasted that long unless they could have other exploits around the world to bring back right. that wealth. And then, and then, and then the development of the U S which effectively had low labor rates and an innovation and a free market, which became, which became the place for innovation and a, and a free, a free market and the lower labor rates that people were taking advantage of in Europe, similarly to what's happening in China today. And so what ends up happening and then what, what happened in, 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 Britain is a lot of that gold moved to the U S because they were more innovative. And if, um, and in, in that system and that, and, and obviously that creates a whole bunch of problems because now, uh, on, on that, on that gold reserve, um, similarly to what's happening in the, in, in the kind of the investment into China, taking advantage of low labor rates, but, but what often not enough, kind of thought through is a natural free market economy with across across all of this on tied to one currency what would happen in china today is labor rates would move up mm-hmm. and what would happen in, in in the us would labor rates would move down mm-hmm. is if if it, and it would find the equilibrium yeah but when in, when when a government is in China, in their case, trying to make sure labor rates stay low and printing money to make sure that that happens to, to peg to the U S and the U S is concurrently trying to keep kind of purchasing power high. The system can never reset. So this, the ebbs and flows, um, uh, uh, can never reset that system around the world would naturally reset through the allocation of labor and time yeah. through, through a Bitcoin standard. Yeah. So a more equal playing field free of interventionism. Right. Would, yeah. So markets would clear errors more quickly. And then the price of labor, labor is a great example, especially in say a purely driven knowledge based profession that your rate, your labor rate in the U S would equal your labor rate in China, right? Over time, over time, that is actually probably what ends up happening over time, over time on a Bitcoin standard. And, 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 and right now, right now there's a lot of asymmetries that look at zoom. I have a business in India um, that builds technology for different, uh, different companies. And it's, it could be in, it it could be in my backyard. Um, It's incredibly productive. Um, at at less than half the labor rate, um, and uh, it, it, so the um, because you're taking an advantage of an asymmetry in the market and technology today, where if we can work on Zoom and we can work from home, wouldn't we hire the best labor anywhere? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. It's a great point and. You know the country, like the U.S., that has, I think, it stands to suffer in that environment a lot because not only is it going to have, I guess, then declining uh, labor rates, but the state itself has these massive unfunded liabilities. So we're going to have declining tax base, declining revenue, same unfunded liabilities that just force. So that, and, and and that's the, that's the printing. Yeah. The printing is decreasing the labor rate. Yes. So there's no way out of it. I mean, no, there's no way out of it. That's the, the existing system is, uh, is, 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 uh, there is no way out of the existing system in today's world with advancing technology. Yeah. There was, there were, and, and even before these debt, these, uh, even in previous, uh, worlds or times, uh, these, if you looked at, uh, Ray Dalio and everything else, the, or the, the, uh, what's the, what's the book called? Uh, fourth turning. 
Mm. These debt super cycles, um, most times end in war and a reset. Mm-hmm. That's what uh, because because there's just no way out. That becomes politically um, it, it, it feasible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have you 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 end up creating an external enemy to find a way out. Yeah, it's, it's driving the divisiveness in the world until there's a breakdown of some kind. Right. And if I said from uh, from Bitcoin specifically, it's actually the, and it doesn't guarantee this outcome, but the more people that know about it and the faster adoption, the kind of the more broad based adoption, the paint to the, to the, to something that looks differently, a, a different, a different system required by where technology is going, mm-hmm. the higher chance, not, not, not a, like a, 99% probability, but the uh, higher probability that we can transition um, with less disruption. There's still going to be disruption. Mm-hmm. But, uh, um, and when that disruption comes, a lot of people will point fingers. Um, um, and if you felt, if you, if, if you didn't have a job and you were living on the street and somebody told you it wasn't your fault, it was that other person's fault, you'd believe them. Mm-hmm. so 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 exactly exactly then that's what's kind of uh, you can start to see some of that forming around the world yeah. and you can start to see the, the kind of really edgy groups kind of all over the place divide <laughs> mm-hmm. um and that's that's what's happening they're in pain they're in pain so the faster to me with with broader bitcoin adoption uh that pain will be less yeah that brings up a new concern. This is uh, a point they lay out in the sovereign individual that the wealth transfer to what they call the cognitive elite would be relatively quick. Like once they've identified, Hey, I can, you know, decrease labor rates by digitizing my business, storing my wealth in Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera, that there would be a massive wealth transfer. And then those people dispossessed in that process may tend to have some anger towards those newly rich individuals, right? People that some people are going to get rich quickly from this transition. Others are going to get crushed in the wave of inflation and taxation. Those that don't identify the exit hatch. So there could be this animosity between, you know, possibly Bitcoiners and uh, people that get hurt in this transition. Yeah. So maybe that's, uh, and that becomes, uh, that becomes a tail risk on the way through on Bitcoin for sure. Yeah. Um, but the, and, and that's actually why if you're painting a better picture and you're bringing more people on, it looks different. You, right. you, you're, you're, you're reducing that tail risk yeah. and you're helping more people um, uh, understand what's, ha- what's happening. The truth is if you look at the, the kind of what, what the billionaire index look and the, like the 0.1% or the 46 million millionaires, in the world, there's only there's only 21 million Bitcoin, maybe yeah. 18 million, three million may never come back. Yeah. But there's, <clears throat> but so so, but let's use 21 million uh, Bitcoin against how much wealth inequality there is today. Mm-hmm. There is no possible way, no even right now that it could look like it does right now. For for the wealthiest, there's no way that they could acquire enough Bitcoin. Right. Yeah. So, so, so this transition, this transition to Bitcoin is actually a redistribution mm-hmm. <clears throat> away from the people who have the most wealth today. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's, I would say almost essential at this point, like, you know, right. we have this world economic forum propaganda being thrown around about the great reset, but it's not something that can be legislated it is something that if it's going to reset properly, it has to be done on the free market. It has to be done bottom up and (laughs) represents. Totally. So to put a button on, I I think gold is an analog AI. I agree. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but what I think I'm just trying to say there is that gold emerged as the ultimate savings technology as a result of savers error correcting across time like you learn the hard way that if you choose to save in silver or glass beads or anything else you get uh 
your wealth gets confiscated effectively over time by those holding savings in a harder medium. So that, that process, I guess I would say that it, it caused savers to gravitate to, towards the most inelastic money supply. So not that gold was an analog AI, but gold was the, the final outcome of the free market AI, or not AI, the free market intelligence yeah. that selected gold as money. So I think the big, the big thrust here for us educators is to explain that to people in a way that they can understand. It's like, yeah, and, and by the way, geopolitical money, and now there's something disrupting it in real time. You need to pay attention to this. Like it's a yeah. major and, and, and error cracked gold. Yes. So, so, so that's what's happened to Bitcoin because gold had a whole bunch of flaws right. that made it easy to, to confiscate. Yeah. And so when people realize the flaws and that it's, uh, that it's, uh, that it can be confiscated, it had less tie into money, yeah. but it didn't lose the belief system of a whole bunch of people that one day it would be tied to money. Right. Belief systems don't change very fast, even if facts change. Right. So it's the belief system, but so that, that error correction, we've seen throughout history what ends up happening with gold as a store of value, governments confiscate it yeah. or they change the rules. And so, so Bitcoin is, or Satoshi, it's kind of, a, it's a beautiful technology, te technology innovation, it's beautiful design. Everything about it is beautiful design to solve those errors right. and take us, uh, take us the, to the, 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 the next leap where we're going in as, as humanity. It's a bit, it's, it's, it is, I believe one of humanity's greatest inventions. Only time will tell, but, uh, but the ability to, to, to forever lock in fair rules that the free market can work. And 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 nobody can take your time. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah, this is the greatest hope we have. I, 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 last thing on this, and I'll I'm, I'm going to skip to your time. But we, so we had this tech that was great for moving value across time was gold, but it was heavy and difficult to move across space. So we abstract gold into a paper currency that represents gold. So effectively created debt, right? That token became a debt token for gold. It was redeemable for gold. Yep. And this gets us back to that dichotomy between equity and debt, time and space, where this equity-based money lets us hold value over time well, but it comes at the cost of not being able to move across space as easily, right? There's a trade-off there. And so it's almost as the pendulum swung too far that direction that we moved into this totally debt-based money. It's no longer redeemable for gold at all. So it completely lost its ability to move value across time, right? Fiat today can just move it across space, but it doesn't hold value across time at all. Right. That's why everyone's right. constantly trying to divest to outpace inflation. And now Bitcoin sort of struck the middle of the road between the two. It's like we have something now that will hold value across time and will can move across space at the speed of light. Yeah, and I would say the across space at the speed of light, we know what's coming on Lightning Network and the second layer and everything else. And and the network is advancing so fast across the, the great minds in it and everything else, advancing, advancing, and advancing. And yes, that will happen. I, I, to me, it, it, with certainty. It's like the um, it's like predicting where the internet would go in ninety five or ninety six, and a lot of people missed that. So, so you and I are kind of we've already done the math, our mental model, and said, okay, well, I can see how this is going to transact value on a second layer, and change the rules there too. Yeah. Um, it, most people don't know that yet because it's not in their everyday life. Right. So, so, so yes, Bitcoin can do that on larger transactions and everything else, but most people have a belief system still because it's so early on Bitcoin that it's just the primary layer. The primary layer opens up the secondary layer yeah. and allows you to, uh, allows you to create everything else that you're talking about. And it's, and, and then that leads into Ethereum and everything else. Why would you use a different secondary layer? to do that job. 
probably wouldn't. Yeah, everything converges at the base layer. Exactly.